Members and witnesses to make sure their mobile phones are completely turned off, please, as they interfere with the broadcasting system. Um, uh, today we're dealing with the future of the beef industry uh, in the context of Food Life 2025. I'd like to welcome from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, uh, Ms. Sinead McPhillips, Assistant Secretary General, uh, Ms. Maria Dunn, Head of Division of Meat and Milk Policy, uh, Ms. Uh, Willa Bruce, Economic and Planning Division. And thank you for coming before the committee today to discuss the, with the committee the future of the beef sector in the context of Food Life 2025. Uh, your privilege. Before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witnesses that are protected by absolute privilege in respect of your evidence you give to the committee. However, if directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to your particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter to qualify a privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings to be given. You are asked to respect the parliamentary passage the effect of where possible. You should not comment, you should not criticise or make charges against any persons or entity by name in such ways that make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary past the effect that members should not comment on, criticise and make charges against either a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Ms Phillips, I understand you are going to make an opening statement now, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the Committee on the latest position in relation to the beef sector and Food Wise 2025. The agri-food sector, as I am sure you all know, is Ireland's largest indigenous industry accounting for 7.8% of modified gross national income, 7.9% of employment and 11.1% of merchandise exports. According to the CSO, the estimated output value of the beef sector at farm level in 2018 was almost 2.4 billion euros. Last year, agri-food sector exports totaled 13.6 billion euros. Irish food is produced by thousands of farmers, fishermen and agri-food companies around the country and this locally produced food is exported to over 180 countries worldwide. In 2018, beef exports were valued at 2.4 billion euros. I am very conscious that the last year has been a difficult year for the beef sector, particularly in terms of unprecedented weather events which resulted in increased input costs due to fodder shortages. The Department is deeply committed to fully supporting and developing Ireland's beef sector. One of the unique strengths of the agri-food sector as a whole has been the shared vision for the sustainable development of the sector in FoodWise 2025. It is crucial that we all continue to work together to address the challenges facing the sector. Minister Creed at meetings of the Beef Roundtable has highlighted the need for stakeholders to recognise their interdependency and to support the sector through efforts to add value and to increase the strengths of all links in the supply chain. Officials in the department are currently engaging extensively with stakeholders in relation to beef producer organisations, which have strong potential to help strengthen the position of the primary producer in the supply chain. The department is also engaged with DG Agri and with stakeholders in giving consideration to the possible development of GI status or geographical indication status for Irish beef. Minister Creed has also made considerable efforts towards facilitating and developing the live export trade including leading a trade delegation to Turkey last year. The live trade will again be a focus of efforts in 2019. In relation to Brexit, I know that you've already had briefings from colleagues in the department on Brexit impacts and preparedness as part of the whole of government Brexit preparations. Brexit poses really enormous challenges for the agri-food and fishery sectors and for the beef sector in particular. Almost half of our beef exports by both value and volume go to the UK market accounting for almost 1.2 billion euros of exports in 2017. In a worst case no deal scenario, tariff and non-tariff barriers, sterling volatility, potentially transport delays and additional overheads would all impact very significantly on the competitiveness of Irish beef exports to the UK. In stepping up to the challenges posed by Brexit, the implementation of the Foodwise strategic recommendations seem more relevant than ever. Foodwise 2025, the 10-year strategy for the agri-food sector, includes more than 400 detailed recommendations spread across the cross-cutting themes of environmental sustainability, market development, competitiveness, innovation and human capital, as well as specific recommendations for key sectors including beef. Foodwise suggested that the ambitious growth projections for the value of the sector were achievable if the recommendations were fully implemented. For example, projecting an increase of 85% in the total value of exports to 19 billion euros in 2025 and an increase of 23,000 in direct and indirect unemployment by 2025. I should stress that these projections did not include volume growth targets. 
Foodwise implementation is very much a live and continuously updated process. Minister Creed chairs the High Level Implementation Committee involving senior officials from relevant departments and state agencies. The committee meets seven times annually to review progress, as well as engaging the stakeholders on key sectoral issues. The meat sector is discussed in detail at the, at the HILAC on a regular basis. A SWOT analysis was undertaken for each sector and was published as part of the Foodwise Strategy in 2015. This SWOT fed into the actions for beef and across the wider themes of Foodwise, which are updated quarterly and reported to Minister Creed through the High Level Implementation Committee. The beef sector SWOT illustrates the strengths of the sector as one of our most important indigenous industries. The strong reputation of Irish grass-fed beef production, our welfare-friendly production system, our cattle and beef traceability systems, and Origin Green's Sustainable Quality Assurance Scheme support a strong reputation in traditional markets. In terms of opportunities, these were identified in the global growth in protein demand and the possibility for expansion into new markets, building on the reputation and quality of our beef. In addition, the use of beef genomics, breeding indices and sex semen were identified as opportunities to address beef quality from the dairy herd and to improve technical efficiency in the suckler herd. Weaknesses were also identified in the sector, including structural issues, low profitability, the sector's dependence on direct payments and dependency on the UK market. Threats identified by the SWOT include animal disease outbreaks, food safety incidents, raw material supply changes linked to dairy expansion and the possible threats linked to new trade deals and cap reform. I will now outline how the issues raised in the beef spot have been addressed across the five cross-cutting themes of Foodwise 2025. The first theme is market development, which identifies the need to ensure that Irish food exports are targeted at the right markets and at the right segments within these markets. Opening and developing new markets is a key part of the government's response to the uncertainties arising from Brexit and is particularly important for beef exports. The opening of the Chinese beef market following a huge effort by Team Ireland over a number of years presents an excellent opportunity for the Irish beef sector from farmers right through to processors. Also in 2018, Minister Creed announced the opening of markets in Qatar and Kuwait to exports of Irish beef, poultry and sheep meat again reflecting ongoing efforts on market access and market development. As part of the Department's action plan on intensifying international market access, a new online international market access tool was, develop was developed. This portal provides information across some of the major export sectors of dairy, meat, seafood and live animals. These initiatives should be a dire direct assistance to the Irish beef sector. They are consistent with the Foodwise 2025 strategy and are all the more relevant against the background of Brexit. The Department will keep market access efforts under review to ensure that resources are deployed to best effect and that our efforts are focused on making real progress in priority markets. Of course, ensuring the highest standards of food safety is fundamental to our industry and particularly to our export success. The next theme of Foodwise is environmental sustainability. Ireland is already one of the world's most efficient food producers in terms of carbon footprint per, per unit of output. But under Foodwise, we are implementing measures to drive down the carbon intensity of our food production even further. Initiatives such as Borbia's world leading Origin Green program, Chagas research on climate change and environment, and the support for national and locally led environmental schemes and knowledge transfer programs provided under the department's rural development program as well as our forestry development program, all contribute to improving the environmental as well as the economic and social sustainability of the sector. The committee will be familiar with the overall ch climate challenge which Ireland faces. Minister Creed has reiterated that every sector will need to play a part and step up to do more on climate action. Foodwise identifies competitiveness as a key theme and includes a recommendation that stakeholders work to improve access to finance for agriculture, forestry and seafood producers and agri-food companies. And the department has been involved in a number of initiatives in recent years, including the Agriculture Cash Flow Loan Support Scheme, the Brexit Loan Scheme for SMEs and the forthcoming Future Growth Loan Scheme, 
focused on capital investment for farmers, fisheries and SMEs. These initiatives have also acted, acted as a catalyst to encourage financial institutions to improve and develop new loan products for the sector. Significant progress has also been made on agri-tax measures focused on the areas of land mobility and succession. Under the Human Capital theme, Foodwise identified a series of actions that support the development of ongoing and lifelong education, training and knowledge transfer programs for farmers. The knowledge transfer program under the RTP has provided significant investment in providing high quality training and upskilling for Irish farmers. The beef program currently includes about 570 knowledge transfer groups consisting of about 9,300 participants. Participation in the beef sector is by far the largest of all six sectors involved in, all, in knowledge transfer. Under the innovation theme, a key foodwise action was the establishment of a meat technology centre as a centre of excellence for meat processing and innovation. Meat Technology Ireland opened in 2017. It is an 8.1 million euro five-year research and innovation programme developed by industry and co-funded by Enterprise Ireland and a consortium of nine beef and sheep meat processing companies. It is hosted by Chagas at its Ashtown Food Research Facility with DIT, DCU, UCC and ICBF as research providers. The centre has an agreed research programme focused on topics including genomics, tenderness, shelf life, carcass characterisation, meat and health. Foodwise also recommended the establishment of a high-level innovation team. This high-level team was established last year and will, will report back to the HILEC in this year. In terms of other supports for beef farmers, the department has rolled out a range of schemes as part of the €4 billion Euros World Development Programme. The Beef Data and Genomics Programme, BDGP, is currently the main support specifically targeted for the suckler sector which provides Irish beef farmers with some 300 million euros in funding over the current period. This scheme is an agri-environmental measure to improve the environmental sustainability of the national suckler herd by increasing genetic merit within the herd. In addition to BDGP, other supports which are available for suckler and sheep farmers under Pillar 2 of the CAP include GLOSS, ANCs and knowledge transfer groups. Suckler farmers also benefit significantly from the basic payment scheme and greening payments under Cap Pillar 1. Chagas National Farm Survey data suggests that suckler farmers receive support equivalent to approximately 500 euros per suckler cow on average across all schemes. It is also envisaged that suckler farmers will be the primary beneficiaries of the 23 million euro increase in ANCs announced in Budget 2019. 20 million euros has been made available under the Beef Environmental Efficiency Pilot, BEEP, which was re recently launched by Minister Creed and is open for applications until this Friday, 22nd of February. The pilot is aimed at further improving the economic and environmental efficiency of beef production by measuring the weaning efficiency of suckler cows. In November 2018, Michael Dowling presented the Foodwise Meat Implementation Group report to the HILEC. This group was convened to monitor and drive the implementation of the meat-specific food-wise actions and the future development of the meat sectors. The report followed a series of meetings between the department and stakeholders across the beef, sheep, pig and poultry sectors. The department was encouraged to see this group comprising stakeholders across the meat sectors and in different tiers of the supply chain collaborating to produce a very useful report which will provide valuable input in the effort to to deliver on the ambition of Foodwise. The issues raised in the group's report included an acknowledgement of the need for specific supports for the suckler sector and the, the need to work on the issue of beef from the dairy herd. The possibility of introducing some form of targeted support for the suckler sector was recommended by the group. However, it accepted that such measures, in addition to providing income support, should be clearly geared towards bringing environmental and welfare quality benefits. Consideration of these issues has fed into the development of the additional supports for the sector, such as the BEEP pilot. In relation to cap reform, the department's key priority is to ensure an adequate cap budget for the agri-food sector. 
The CAP budget is fundamentally important to Irish farmers, particularly now at a time of Brexit uncertainty and in the context of dealing with very serious climate change obligations and challenges in the future. Based on nine objectives, the future CAP will continue to ensure access to high quality food and strong support for the unique European farming model. The Department is currently examining all appropriate measures to support the different agri-food sectors during that CAP reform process. Finally, we have now as a Department begun preparations on developing the next 10-year strategy to replace Foodwise 2025. It is envisaged that this will be published in 2020. Without preempting the content of the next plan, it is clear that the broad cross-cutting themes contained in Foodwise will continue to remain highly relevant. Clearly, there are broader policy developments that will have a strong impact on the development of the strategy, particularly the outcome of cap reform, climate action and Brexit. In terms of process, 2019 will see the preparation of background discussion papers, a public consultation, a stakeholder event, the establishment of an independent committee by the Minister, and the beginning of that committee's deliberations. Then in 2020, the committee should conclude its work by agreeing on a new strategy, which will then be the subject to an environmental assessment before finalisation. The Department will be seeking the views of the Joint Breakfast Committee as part of that process and looks forward to input from the Committee on the new strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McPhillips. Uh, the number of questioners are starting off. Uh, Senator Connell Walsh, first of all, followed by Deputy Kennedy, followed by Deputy Cahill. Um, thank you, Cahill, look, um, and thank you for your uh, presentation today. Um, there's extreme concern out there uh, in the farming community around the prices as they are at the moment and the incomes, the fact that incomes have fallen or are down 16%. And that's without Brexit, with beef prices being at an all-time low. So I need to ask you first in relation to the exports, what the department has done in relation to so 52% of beef is exported to Britain. So what specifically uh, has the department and the minister done to ensure that that 52% is protected, that the British uh, market is protected and that be the Irish beef will hold its position within the British market? So what specifically is done around that? And, I mean, has it been considered um, the, the price of the, the suckler cows and the... Um, uh, the payments to the suckler cow, has that seriously been considered? So the IFA and other farming organisations are asking for a 200 euro, um, a two, 200 euro uh, support uh, package per cow. Um, so what's been done in that regard? And the other question I want to ask you is around what the, the Minister and the Department have done to, um, to increase the prices that are being given by the factories. So just some tangible things. I welcome all the things that you, you have, like the genomics and the other schemes that you've announced, but I think there's a real urgency around uh, securing uh, the incomes that are there, but also addressing the shortfalls there is at, as without, um, even without Brexit. I'll leave my questions at that for the moment. Deputy Kenny. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, open statement. Uh, it's quite informative. The, there's a couple of bits and pieces, I suppose. First of all, the, in regard to the, the beef exports, you said um, are valued at, at 2. Point, I go up again? 2.4 billion euros, and that's the farm gate uh, price. So basically, that's the, return, that's the return to the farmer. Is that is that correct, or is that the actual value of it from a, from a processor's point of view? Um, also, in regard to the the, the issue. And, and it comes to the very core of it, is that while there, there is a continuous effort for to create more markets and to push further, further afield and to ensure that we get uh, more markets for Irish produce in, in whatever, wherever we can get them, and it was um, acknowledged that to get the, the right space in the right market as well for our particularly unique product. Uh, the return to the farmer from that, and it's, it's something that they've had a gripe with for some time, that while in a sense... Uh, Taxpayers' money is used through Board BIA and through other agencies for, for 
you know, find the markets and to try and research and develop the markets in various countries. Uh, yet the primary producer at the other end seems always to be the one that gets the squeeze on them. And I, and I just wonder, is, is in the context of uh, Foodways 2025 or whatever will replace it, is there a possibility of, of putting some um, ra ratio in there that as the price increases or as a price is got for, for a product, that the primary producer would be have some entitlement to a particular uh, element of that price? Because the, the difficulty we have is that um, farmers see that they continually get squeezed down while at the other end of it the, the processors, the supermarkets, whoever else, all the other ends seem to be making money at their expense. And, and we need to find some way of, of managing that in a, in a fairer and more uh, appropriate manner. Uh, also in regard to the, um, the, the, the various supports that are in place, and this, particularly the, the, the supports around the, the suckler cow, the ANC was mentioned, all the other elements of it, which end up going back to the farmer, more and more of that from what we can see, and certainly the, 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 uh, the sound that's coming from the next cap, it's going to be more about uh, environmental measures and it's going to be more about the public goods that's been done by the farmer rather than what they produce and how they produce it. And uh, I, I'd just like to get some more information in regard to that, if you have it, as to what way um, the farmer can see a benefit going into the future. because. Certainly where I am talking to a lot of suckler farmers, they're, they're, they're saying they're keeping as few animals as they can to get the maximum number of, of benefits possible, and they don't see any payback for increasing or for even keeping up the levels that they were at. Uh, and also the pressure that's coming on, and the pressure is coming on from everywhere, uh, for to, to cut back at a scale back. And uh, I just wonder in respect of that, uh, and it's, it's mentioned in, in, in the very open remarks that you say that you know, it's, it's about increasing the value rather than increasing the volume. And yet there is certainly uh, a great fear there that uh, while that may be the case, the value is for somebody else rather than for the farmer. And, and I think we need to see some, some element of, of um, clear advantage when put into this for the farmer to, to try and save the suckler cow in the beef sector. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank the officials for their presentation. Um, I hope they won't take anything I'm going to say in the next few minutes personally. But to say I'm cross after hearing the statement um, would be an understatement. Uh, I'm a dairy and beef farmer. And um, like this, the lack of realisation about the crisis that the beef industry is in at the moment is frightening. We have a statement here, 180 countries worldwide. 96% of our beef is being sold in the EU, and the 4% that's going outside it is off. So this thing that we have all these great markets for our beef is bunkum. We are not selling it. We haven't moved an iota in the last 10 years as regards developing markets. And let's, let's state facts and not, not be trying to hoodwink people. 96% of our beef is sold within the EU, and that's what's sold outside of it is sold as offal. That's China and the rest. A wheelbarrow went to the States. That's what all the beef that went to the States. The Department is deeply committed to fully supporting and developing Ireland's beef, beef sector. Our sector is on its knees. I have never seen such despondency among beef farmers. Foodwise 2020 or Harvest 2025 there's no mention of the profitability of fattening cattle in it, or the profitability of producing beef. And to say, low, I see here, low profitability of the sector. The reality at the moment is, men are losing money hand over fist. A conservative estimate at the moment would be that cattle would want to be making 4.60 a kilo to break even. And that would be a conservative estimate at the feed cost of feeding cattle at the moment. You're going on the grid at 3.75 for steers. And God help you if you have Frisian steers to kill, you're getting a return of about 340 per kilo. Cattle are losing a fortune, and beef farmers are losing a fortune. And this statement here, like, Mr. Creed has made considerable efforts towards facilitating and developing the live export trade, including a trade delegation to Turkey last year. The live trade will again be a focus of efforts in 2019. We have no cattle 
over 12 months of age being exported at the moment. We have no market for live exports. We have a situation where we knew that the Daily Herald was going to expand rapidly. And we haven't put the infrastructure in place to get Phrygian calves out of the country in greater numbers. We exported 160,000 calves last year. Borbia received a levy of around 300,000 on the export of those calves. And we haven't got adequate layerage facilities on the continent to take calves this spring. Our dairy herd is expanding at a fairly significant rate. And we'll be lucky to hit the 160,000 this year. So instead of you know, efforts to a focus on live exports, in my opinion, we have gone the other way. Again, here we have on Food Wise 2025, market development. That just hasn't happened. Market development hasn't happened, and I've, I've outlined, I've outlined the, the figures which clearly show. And Food Wise, the last line here, the last line here in the first paragraph on Food Wise 2025, I should stress that these projections did not include volume growth targets. And why didn't they? Because we knew we were going to have more cattle in the country. So surely there should have been volume growth targets in place. We knew the dairy herd was going to expand at a very significant rate. The other side of the report had that we were going to increase milk production by 50 per cent by 2020. And we knew from that that there would be a serious, um, a serious increase in cattle numbers in the country. But there's no volume growth targets in place. So to me, you know, that's, that's just ignoring the inevitable. And unfortunately, the inevitable is there now. And we have for the last three to four months a kilo of 40,000 cattle per week, which we are just not able to sell at a viable price. And that is the reality of Foodwise 2025. And unfortunately, that reality is not being faced up to. Another line here we have, I just, I underline the things I suppose that annoyed me most in, in, in the presentation. Sex semen. Yes, sex semen would play a huge part in, but have we done anything to develop it? Has any money really been put into developing sex semen? Has it become economically viable to use sex semen? Has the fertility of sex semen improved? No, it has not, or no resources put into it. And again here, there are the weaknesses, low profitability. Beef farmers at the moment would be delighted if they were, if they were able to discuss profitability. The reality is that, you know, it's, it's how much is being lost at the moment. And all through your document, I see no mention anywhere about the, 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 the person who is finishing those cattle at the moment. And the reality is, at the end of the day, the man who's going back to buy the store coming out of the dairy herd or the weaning being produced by the suckler, if he hasn't got a margin for feeding those cattle, he's not able to go back and give a viable, a viable price for them. And that's the major problem that's facing us with young cattle this spring, when cattle start coming out of the sheds to be sold. Is the man that you know, has finished the cattle, is he going to have any firepower to buy, to buy those stores? And that's, you know, that's about um, discussing the, the complications of, of, of Brexit and the, the huge damage that, that Brexit can, can do to our, our main market, the UK. Again, you know, the loans and low-cost loans Farmers are waiting two years for what was announced in 2017 to be put on the table. It has been postponed and postponed and postponed with low-cost loans. But at the moment, if a beef man went near the bank for a loan, he, he, you know, he, he just would not be entertain, entertained. Because unfortunately, getting money from a financial institution, you have to have the financial capacity to pay it back. And no beef man has that capacity at the moment. And then, you see here, 500 euros per cow on average across all schemes. And I tell you, you'll be lucky if, it, if you put that in front of a bunch of beef farmers at the moment, you'd want to be sitting very, very near the door. Because the reality is that suckler cow is costing that farmer money. But he can avail of all those schemes, bad the knowledge transfer, I, I accept that, but he can avail of all those schemes, gloss, A and C, etc. He can avail of those and have donkeys on, on, on his holding. He doesn't have to suck her cows to avail of any of those schemes. So, you know, to put that figure in there, I think is highly irritating at best to, to suck farmers. And I could use a, a far stronger word. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's demeaning. The need to work on the issue of beef from the dairy herd. We're four years now from the abolition of quotas. It's, you know, it's late in the day to be thinking about the need to work on the issue of beef from the Daily Herald. 
And like we have an issue of, of cross beds being produced on, on the dairy herd, and that is an issue and a, and a serious issue. But as I said earlier on, sex semen and the, that we could produce um, Abin Angus and Hereford cattle out, out, out of the dairy, out, out of the, out from the dairy herd, that would go into the Hereford Prime and, and the, uh, the Abin Angus schemes that have been promoted fairly, ex fairly extensively. But no work has been done whatsoever on it. And, you know, we're talking that, you know, the next cap reform, and, you know, that will be, that will, the reality about the next cap reform is, and beef farmers at the moment are eating into their cap payment to, to keep bread on the table. It's going, it's going to be a huge Everest to climb to maintain the cap budget that we have. We have the black hole that's been, le that's been left with the, with the, with the exit of, of, the U of the UK uh, um, um, from, from the EU, and it's going to be hugely um, difficult to maintain the cap budget. Uh, you know, we have immigration and, and defence becoming huge issues with, with, other, with other EU member states, and cap and the importance of cap has diminished among, uh, among a lot of our, of our, of our other fellow um, EU members. So, you know, farmers, unfortunately, their reliance on their cap payment is going to increase, but the same budget is, is, isn't going to be there from it. But I'd have to say, and I said, I'm not, I'm not being personal to the, sec, to, to the Assistant Secretary in my, in my comments. It's, it's obviously a department document. But that is a response from the department to the challenges that has been faced by the beef industry at the moment. I would have to say it is insult. There's no realisation out there at the moment of the huge crisis that's in beef farming. And if we, if we wait around like Nero watching Rome burning, it's not, we're not going to have a beef industry in 12 months' time. And we've had, we have failed to get these freezing calves out of the country this spring in the numbers that are going to be needed. Talking about now getting facilities in Cherbourg, <coughs> we're in the middle of our calving season. And, you know, we're not getting calves out in the numbers that we need to. So that 40,000 hit, that 40,000 kill that we have for the last three to four months, unfortunately, is going to be maintained. You have men at the moment with Frisian bulls coming to 24 months of age, and they're begging processors to take them off them. They're not asking the price, just will you kill them for me? Because once they get over 24 months of age, their value is, is reduced dramatically. I, a neighbour of mine had very good cows to sell the other day. He was told they'd be taken off them in three weeks' time. You know, the, our, our, in the crisis that our industry is, is in cannot be overestimated. And to me, this response is extremely poor in the extreme. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Before I go to the witnesses, I just have a couple of questions myself. Uh, I suppose maybe to a certain extent to carry on from where Deputy Cahill uh, stopped. Uh, I suppose our body of work in this committee is, uh, is to do an analysis basically on, on where the future of the beef industry lies based on a SWOT analysis that, that your department have done. Uh, but the SWOT analysis was done in 2015, uh, before David Cameron even decided he was going to have a referendum on Brexit, before the referendum took place on the 23rd of June 2016, and before the British people made a huge mistake to do the, make the decision they made. So how accurate is the analysis that you have done in view of the point that I made a few minutes ago about all those things that have happened since you did that analysis? Would it be up to date? You know, uh, we also have the challenge of, of climate change coming down the line, uh, and that has to feed. How, how are we going to square that circle uh, of increasing production while at the same time we have people on the other side of the, of the argument complaining that uh, we have a, too much of an increase in stock numbers? Uh, how is that circle going to be, to be uh, uh, squared? Uh, and on the other issue, I suppose, uh, we have the, the average, uh, it is 115 per cent of circular farmers' income comes from Europe. Uh, that's a fact. Uh, that is not sustainable, I would imagine, going forward. Uh, and the only way that the farmer, the circular farmers' viability can be maintained is getting a decent and a fair price for the product at the other scale, so it's the other end of the scale. And that problem is, is where the issue lies at the moment, in my opinion. And what extra has been done to try and uh, equalise the situation whereby 115 per cent, even though it won't be sustainable going forward, that the sector farmer can be viable, not depending on uh, the money coming from Europe on a weekly, on a rather an, an annual basis. So I suppose it's basically going feeding back into the conversation that Deputy Cat has started uh, as regards to SWOT analysis, first of all, uh, the strengths, weaknesses and, and, tar and challenges, and, and there are many obviously, 
the, the strengths are probably the ones, the obvious ones that we all know about, grass-fed and so on, support and traceability. Um, the weaknesses and the challenges are probably greater, in my opinion, in 2019 uh, than they were in 2015 when the analysis was done. So, Ms. McPhillips, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I try and work through in order, if I can, and, and please come back to me if, I, if, if I've missed any of those questions. Um, in relation to Brexit, obviously we recognise that Brexit is a significant threat to our, to our beef sector and to our beef exports. A lot of that rests on the decision that the UK takes in relation to the tariffs that are applied. As you know, if the UK makes a decision to apply the EU's tariff schedule for beef, um, the work that the Department has done has estimated that that would incur a tariff cost in the order of 70% on our beef exports to the UK. So that would be a cost of 780 million if it was paid uh, as a once-off. And that would obviously seriously undermine the competitiveness of our beef on the UK market. Now, we hope that's not the decision that, that the UK takes. The UK will take that decision over the next week or so, we understand, as to what what specific tariff regime they apply to, to exports from the EU. Um, that's largely outside of our, our control, but we have, obviously, uh, Minister Creed has, since the referendum, has gone around Europe sensitising our partners, sensitising the Commission to the threat that we face from Brexit, uh, for beef in particular, and has had significant uh, engagement with other member states in relation to that threat. He's recently had a, 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 one of a series of meetings with Commissioner Hogan uh, explaining the, the issues to him and seeking whatever assistance is available from the EU if that no, no uh, deal, hard Brexit, hard tariff scenario emerges, which we very much hope it will not. Uh, but there's certainly been a very detailed and good understanding from both Commissioner Hogan and from commission, commission officials in DG Agri as to what, as to the exposure of the beef sector to those, to those impacts. And we've recently had a delegation over from DG Agri to discuss in more detail what possible, um, what avenues of EU support might be available in that event. Um, in relation to pro I ask you on that, you see, there in the problem lies, mm. is that the whole beef in our whole beef industry, at least 52 percent of it, that the exports go to Britain, we're at completely at the behest of the goodwill, the goodwill of the Tories, if you like, depending on the deal, and that and that on that on top of what's happening at the moment in terms of beef, beef prices, is is absolutely enormous. And what farmers are concerned about is, okay, while these discussions might be going on, they need to see something tangible there, something that can be drawn down at short notice. Because you know yourself how long it takes to put schemes in place, whether it be through the IT systems or whatever else that's needed to do that. So if we're going to have a hard Brexit, and we're going to have maybe eight to 12 months without the supports being there, and there are thousands of farmers across the, the country that won't be in existence anymore. Yeah, but it's a lot of what Senator Conway was, mm -hmm. it's probably our worst case scenario yes. is 70 per cent imposition of tariffs, obviously, as what yes. you mentioned. What work have we been doing to yeah. counteract that at the moment? That's really what you're... That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. I, I'm trying to get at what is there immediately come the beginning of April. You know, can you give reassurance to the farmer, the beef farmers out there today? that when we've seen how the Tories have handled Brexit so far, you know, it doesn't fill people with confidence. And we are really concerned that yes, um, an industry um, that's already on its knees is going to be... We certainly share rapid. that concern. I suppose in terms of supports, we have had detailed discussions, as I mentioned, with Commissioner Hogan and DG Agri officials in relation to the various avenues of EU support that might be available and obviously stressed the, the urgency of deploying those measures immediately if that, if that worst case transpires. So the, the avenues we've been discussing with them include uh, under the common market organisation regulations, there are traditional market supports uh, such as aids to private storage and inter public intervention. And there's also exceptional aid available under, the, under that regulation. 
so in relation to beef in particular, we have made the point, uh, and the Minister has made this point very strongly, that those traditional market supports are not adequate to support beef prices because the intervention rate is set at a very low level, which would be, uh, which would be, uh, which would not be impactful in terms of the crisis that we would face. So we have focused very much on the ask there in terms of exceptional aid, and that has been deployed by the EU in the past. Particularly, uh, an example that's particularly relevant is when the Russian ban came in in 2014. Um, the, that exceptional aid was used to help the Baltic states and Finland, whose, whose market was basically wiped out overnight by the Russian ban. And there was a very rapid EU response and deployment of exceptional aid for those countries. Um, the other avenue, apart from the Common Market Organisation regulation that we're pursuing, is the state aid regulations. Mm -hmm. As you know, there's state aid, uh, there's general state aid, which is administered by DG Comp. And along with, with colleagues in the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, we have had a lot of discussions with DG Comp on those general state aids for proce the processing sector mainly. And we've also discussed with uh, experts in DG Agri in relation to state aid uh, under agriculture guidelines um, and what flexibilities might be available there. There's certainly been a willingness uh, on the EU to engage in those detailed discussions uh, obviously, the, the, the deployment of those instruments would be, and would be urgent if the worst case transpires, and, we, and that is what the finish. So, I mean, the Commissioner Hogan has, has reiterated to us the EU's readiness to respond and support Ireland, and we will obviously remain in close contact with uh, both the Minister and the Commissioner and ourselves with officials on these issues as the, the situation evolves. Okay, so just on the exceptional aid, if it was to be, if the decision was to be made tomorrow on exceptional aid, how long would it be before that aid would reach the farmer? Well, I suppose the, the, the decision on exceptional aid would depend on the outcome of Brexit. And as but just say in the case of, say, the, the Russian scenario where the Russian ban was, how long did it take from the time the decision was made until um, it reached? I, the I believe that that regulation, and Maria might correct me, she was in, in Russia at the time. Uh, it was December. It, it, it was in December, and the ban came in in August. But you must remember, it was a very different situation because the ban came in overnight. I mean, while there was ongoing political difficulties, we didn't realise the ban was going to come in. It came in overnight on the sixth of August, um, 2014. So there was no time for either the Commission or those states to prepare for it. Okay, so you would be talking about exceptional aid being, uh, once the decision was, was, was finalised, that it would be made within weeks to the farmer? We would, we would certainly be pushing for as rapid a deployment of that exceptional aid as possible. And you have the IT systems and all that that will support that? Well, we would, we would need, yes, I mean, our, our IT systems are, are very adaptable to new schemes. I mean, it would have to be done on the basis of uh, objective criteria which would be agreed with the, with the Commission. In other words, it wouldn't, you know, there would have to be some scheme developed. And our, our aim would be to develop as simple as possible. I'm sorry, yeah, I have a vote. Thank you. Um, if you reply to my colleague, maybe. thanks. Sorry about this. Thank you. Um, so just to continue, I suppose, uh, just in terms of prices, I mean, obviously the department doesn't have a role in setting prices and can't interfere in terms of, of competition between um, between the factories and and farmers. Uh, I suppose what we've tried to uh, to make efforts is in relation to. Uh, better integration of the whole supply chain. So for instance, the development of beef producer groups, we would, beef producer organizations, we would see as a good option in terms of, of strengthening the power of the farmer in the beef supply chain. That's worked reasonably well in other sectors and certainly colleagues have engaged uh, in detailed discussions and briefings with interested groups. And I suppose what we'd like to see and Maria again might comment on this further, is if we could get one or two good examples of, of such groups being established and working well, we could see that as having a, a positive effect. 
Yeah, this was something that the Minister said at the last Beef Forum when he called on um, all stakeholders to work together to ensure that all the different elements of the supply chain were um, adequately rewarded. And um, one of the things that we have been trying to work on encouraging is beef producer organisations. The legislation is there for the organisations to be recognised and we have a funding system in place um, to provide grants. We have a system of um, approved facilitators and you can get a, a producer organisation or a prospective producer organisation can avail of a grant to avail of those facilitators help to set them up. We have some, had some interest from groups in the idea of a producer organisation, but I suppose it's still quite new to the Irish system. So we have had a number of meetings and have, um, have planned a seminar next month, which will include speakers from the Commission and speakers from the Department. Um, it should have a role. It won't be the solution to everything, but it should have a role in strengthening the farmer's position in the supply chain. And I would note that in the next um, iteration of the CAP, the documents I've seen to date, they would have a lot more central role for these type of organisations. Let's be aware that Commissioner Hogan has, has brought forward a, a series of, of measures at EU level aimed at strengthening the, the position of the producer in the supply chain, including the, the Unfair Trading Practices Directive, but also increasing use of dashboards to, to provide better information and more transparent information on pricing across the system. Um, so while none of those threads are, are a magic bullet, I suppose, to, to strengthen the, the supply, the, the position of the producer, we would hope that in combination um, they, should, they should have some effect. Um, so, sorry, can I ask about the supply yeah. chain issue that you mentioned? And the Commission, I think we discussed it here fairly uh, regularly here. Uh, like the general feeling was that what was introduced at Commission level was an important first step, but wasn't going to go far enough at all. Uh, you know, it was only a very watered down version of what would be required. Is there plans within the Department to have a more robust process in place? To, to, might complement what the Commission has introduced? Specifically in relation to the unfair trading practices. Exactly. Um, well, I suppose the position is now, and I know I, I briefed the committee on this uh, some, I think it was last September, mm -hmm. uh, that the directive is now uh, at EU level almost finalised and is just subject to, to final legal scrubbing. So that directive will come in and then there's a two-year implementation uh, time frame. So because there's, there's quite a lot of overlap between um, the, the draft directive on unfair trading practices and our existing grocery goods regulations, which are under, um, <coughs> under the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, uh, we are setting up a working group with that department to work through those issues to, to consider how the directive will be transposed into, into Irish law. Okay. Um, so to come back on a, a couple of specifics to Deputy Kenny then, uh, yeah, actually it's, it's a coincidence, you, I mentioned uh, the output value of the beef sector at farm level in 2018 was almost 2.4 billion and that's also uh, the, the figure for, for total, the total value of beef exports, so that's just a coincidence. Um, in Deputy Cahill, I, I did say that, that Irish food is exported to over 180 countries around the world, which I think is correct. Obviously, beef is exported to, to, a, to about 70 countries. We have, access we have market access to 70 countries. Um, in relation to China, I suppose what the department does in terms of its market access efforts is to open markets, and that is a significant barrier. Uh, to, to trade. So to, to understand the requirements of the importing country, to demonstrate that our standards meet those requirements, uh, to have a series of audits and inspection visits until that country is satisfied that uh, we can be given market access to their country. So in the case of China, that was a long drawn out process over many years uh, with a range of people within the department, within industry, at farm level, obviously board via uh, making that effort because we could see the opportunity there in, in the Chinese market. If you take it that the, uh, currently the Chinese consumer um, eats on average five or six kilos of beef a year, that compares to an Irish person consuming 19 kilos of beef. Uh, even a small increase on the part of the Chinese consumer 
means, means a huge additional demand. Now, to date, uh, the, as the Deputy says, we have exported a small amount. We have exported 1,000 tonnes of beef to date, and I understand and acknowledge that that is very small when compared to the 290,000 tonnes we export to the UK. But it is a start, frozen and it is frozen boneless beef. It's, it's, it's what not access for. Uh, we don't have access for offal. Uh, so it's a start, but we see significant opportunities there. And Board B's Market Insights and Consumer Research suggests that there are significant growth opportunities there. Uh, but in relation to any market, uh, what we're doing is really opening the door, and then it's up to industry to develop on those opportunities. Um, the reason why we're exporting 52% uh, of our beef to the UK, I would suggest, is because it is the best re retail market in Europe and the highest priced retail market. And so, you know, there are very good geographical, social, cultural reasons and economic reasons for being there. And if this event hadn't happened, we would be quite content with that market. Um, so obviously there is a focus on expanding market access around the world, creating opportunities which may be taken up by industry or from year to year, depending on, on what the, the market situation is, they may go elsewhere. But that's what we would see as our role in terms of market access, is opening the, the opportunity to, to more markets. Um, in terms of um, payments, I think a number of deputies uh, focused on payments not being linked to production which is, of course, the case. I mean, we made a, a policy decision in around 2003-2004 cap reform that uh, we would go for full decoupling of payments from production. And since then, the, both direct payments under Pillar 1 and the payments on the Royal Development Programme have not been based on uh, a payment per animal. Uh, in relation to Royal Development Programme schemes, including BDGP, those payments must be justified. Um, so they, they must um, add value and there must be a clear benefit to, to uh, an environmental good or public good from making that payment. And that's obviously the trend that will continue in terms of cap reform. Uh, Deputy Cahill mentioned the, the issue of the cap budget and I think one of the, the main strengths of uh, the cap in making the case for additional funding is to be seen to be meeting uh, key demands from the EU consumer. So demands for environmental goods, uh, protection of the landscape, protection of, of the rural economy. That's being relevant to those priorities is the only way that we will ensure that the cap budget is actually protected in the future. Sorry, I know there are, other, there are probably other questions that people want to come back on. Yeah, the SWOT analysis, uh, 2015, yes. as opposed to where we are now at the moment and everything that has happened since 2015, obviously the landscape has changed completely, the world has changed literally completely. Absolutely, Chairman, and obviously we, didn't, uh, we definitely didn't anticipate uh, Brexit uh, occurring in 2015 and certainly not in, in the, the catastrophic way that we're, we're seeing it emerge at the moment. Um, but I suppose when we look behind the, the, the SWOT and towards the recommendations that, that came out of it, um, those detailed 400 recommendations are very much focused on uh, efficiency, uh, effectiveness, innovation, developing new markets. I, I think those are priorities that we would still uh, see as key in terms of addressing both the environmental challenges and the Brexit challenges. Um, so I'm sure if we were doing the SWOT again, and we will be starting the process of revisiting the SWOT uh, later in this year, in this year um, there are points of emphasis I suppose we would, we would differ on. But I think in terms of the actions that came out of it and uh, the implementation of those actions, I don't think there's anything we would do particularly um, differently other than adding as I say, changing the regards developing new markets, mm. we're potentially replacing our main market, as in the GB market, uh, in the event of things going drastically wrong over the next number of weeks, and replacing that 
whatever it was, 2.4 billion of exports, uh, is not going to be easily done in a short pace of time. Absolutely not, and I suppose that, that is the last thing we would want to do. I mean, we would want to maintain that supply chain, uh, maintain those customer relationships that have been, um, you know, the, the contracts that have been hard won in key retailers in the UK. Um, and if that beef is displaced, it creates a significant problem on the EU market and has a significant effect on prices in other EU member, member states. And I suppose in terms of sensitising other uh, ministers and departments to uh, Brexit as an Irish problem, we've also presented it as a problem for across the e e EU. So if that, if that product is displaced from the UK market, it's going to depress prices across the EU and we, we will need that support in order to try and maintain those supply chains. Deputy McConnell and Deputy Carpen Kennedy next. Deputy Murphy. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and I'd like to thank uh, Mick Phillips and uh, our team from the Department for coming in and presenting before us today. Um, and obviously the reason um, we here at, within the Agriculture Committee are engaging on this project in relation to examining the beef sector in particular with regard to Foodwise 2025 targets is because of the massive pressure that the beef sector is under, and in particular, um, uh, specifically the massive pressure that the primary producer and farmers are under. And um, they are currently in the midst of a crisis, and they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're not um, certainly not uh, uh, immune to crises because they've seen plenty before, but the one that is facing them at the moment is particularly acute and is existential in terms of, for many of them, being able to continue in the sector. Um, and certainly looking at uh, the presentation today in relation to where the department are coming from, it, there isn't a sense coming through that there is a vision there in terms of how the primary producer and how the farmer can be profitable and how there is a viable um, future for many in the beef sector um, in terms of actually being able to produce and get a profit for it. And we know the figures in relation to how Foodwise 2025 is producing for the country in terms of exports. Um, we know uh, overall that the increased production of, of, of meat um, and beef is leading to increased exports as well, um, though not enough. Um, and that has a certain uh, that has certainly has a benefit for the country. But the flip side of that is that because we don't have sufficient markets for the increased beef that is that we are producing, it is causing a massive crisis in relation at, at farm gate level and in terms of farmers not being able to make and make, make, make a profit. A key part of that has been the, growing, uh, the, the growth in our dairy herd and the fact that there isn't sufficient outlet for the increased stock coming off and increased beef coming off that dairy herd. Um, and we've discussed here previously the issue in relation to getting live exports, uh, particularly at calf stage out of the country. Um, and I know in your presentation you indicated that the Minister uh, and the, the Government are um, making efforts in relation to live exports, and I would just like you to elaborate further in relation to where exactly that is at. Um, and I know it's something we, we are looking to follow up further, particularly as well specifically on the issue of, of the ongoing live, expert, live export trade um, to France um, of, uh, of, of calves coming off the dairy herd. Um, I'd also like to, to, you to flesh out further just the Department's view in relation to um, the sucker cow herd versus the um, dairy beef uh, herd and in terms of the viability and how um, the future of both those sectors. How exactly does the department envisage um, our beef sector at farm level evolving over the next number of years? Um, and in, with specific reference to the, the sucker herd, because if we look um, uh, in the last couple of years in relation to numbers coming off it, um, calf numbers are down. Um, and uh, if we look at the profitability of it, um, without, um, without additional support coming into play, it's simply not going to be sustainable for farmers, for the suckler herd, to, to make a profit. Um, in relation to, um, you, you mentioned the beef producer groups as being something which you feel could, uh, could have a positive impact. I would be just interested in hearing further detail in relation to how that might unfold. And, my particular concern there, while I see the merit in them, is if you're operating in a market which is already oversupplied, 
How exactly, I mean, how, how, do we, how much of an impact do we see the beef, beef producer groups going to be able to make in relation to getting a better, a better outcome and a better uh, a profit level for, for farmers? Um, I know it will be verging into pro territory probably which the department don't, don't, don't deal with, but um, in relation to current prices which are there, um, and obviously the prices that are paid are absolutely critical to where our beef sector are going, and that's why I'm asking you it. But in relation to the current prices that are being paid, we have seen a situation in recent, over the last number of months, where um, the Irish the price paid to Irish beef producers has gone from being 5 to 10 per cent above the EU average price paid to 5 to 10 per cent below the average EU, EU price. Um, and uh, I'd be interested in the department's assessment in relation to the dynamic um, at, play, at play there. Um, I know we also have, and you've referred it to in your presentation, in relation to the, the moves afoot at the Commission level in relation to unfair trading practices, and that's something we've discussed here um, previously. But I'd be interested in hearing, do the Department see that as something that specifically is going to have a specific benefit to the beef sector? Um, because while it is certainly in terms of groceries and um, contracts, um, you know, and particularly for vegetables and, and, and that type of produce, I've never seen it explained clearly by anyone the impact it could potentially have in relation to proving, improving the transparency in the food chain and in the pricing chain within, within, the, uh, within the beef sector uh, specifically. Um, I know the overall objective of the Foodwise 2025 as well is to, is to drive value as opposed to volume. Um, however, I don't see that happening in the beef sector. While we're seeing it in other sectors, in the dairy sector in particular, unfortunately what we're seeing in the beef sector is more volume and less, va and, and less value increase uh, and less, less profit um, for, for the farmer as a result. And um, Deputy Cahill touched on this earlier in relation to that we're not getting the increased volume outlets for our, for our beef. Um, and I believe that's something that, you know, as a country we need to address very promptly. Um, Brexit aside, if we're, to, if we're to actually not see further pressure on our, on our beef prices uh, over, over, the coming, over the coming period. Um, I'd be interested as well, and obviously for, from a dairy perspective, uh, from a dairy perspective, we have been rated as number one in terms of efficiency, carbon efficiency uh, in Europe. And from a beef perspective, we've been rated, I think, up into, uh, as, as fifth placed. Uh, there was a report, and that has, that's been a big selling point um, for, for the Irish agriculture and also um, a, key, a key aspect as well in terms of how we would approach or uh, the climate change issue. I would be interested in the perspective of, your, of yourselves um, and the department in relation to the UN report which came out in the last week, um, uh, if, if, if the department have had a chance to assess it yet, uh, which would be challenging or the, challenging how we make those assessments in relation to our, our, the carbon efficiency, um, because uh, certainly I think we, we do have a, a very strong product here domestically, but, but um, that uh, report such as that certainly um, would need a, a robust response um, from the department and uh, uh, um, interrogation. Um, that uh, pretty much covers most of my questions, and just, just, just a final one, and Deputy Cahill touched on it as well, the fact that 96 per cent of our exports um, are within the EU market, um, and uh, despite the fact that with increased attention and uh, marketing, uh, particularly uh, in light of Brexit for, for, product dif for, for market diversification, we've seen a volume increase in the last year to, to, the, British, to the British market in terms of our beef. Um, and uh, what is the department's outlook in relation to the potential for additional exports and how, what is the graph that you foresee there given your engagement and feedback from Board BIA and the department's own assessment with regard to the known EU markets um, and you know, particularly the, the American market hasn't despite the, 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 a lot of, a lot of um, uh, hype around at the time certainly hasn't delivered in relation to uh, the outlet that could have been expected but um, uh, and listen, the one thing I haven't touched on is Brexit, um, and I, 
whatever about the pressure that the beef sector is under, were we to uh, face a hard Brexit in, in a number of weeks' time, I think it would put the caboose entirely uh, in terms of uh, the viability of the beef sector. We have to stand ready uh, to try and intervene and, and provide, um, provide supports in, in that scenario. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be keen to hear further feedback from you in relation to the, uh, the, 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 the price support that can be put in place in that eventuality, because certainly from engagement we've had with, with the, the sector, um, assisted aid to private storage or, or intervention, uh, which, would, which would have the impact of seeing us lose market space in Britain, wouldn't, it would not be sustainable at all at all um, in, the, in, the, in the, the medium, short to medium term and longer. Um, and we have to be able to stand ready uh, to, to step in in that, in that eventuality and um, uh, immediately uh, if it comes to pass. But I think, um, needless to say, our objective has to be able to avoid it because it pre presents a very um, appalling vista altogether for the beef sector in particular. Deputy, uh, Deputy Parkin Kennedy, next please. And thank you very much uh, to Ms McPhillips and your colleagues for coming in this evening to help us consider the report that we will be producing uh, in relation to the future of the beef sector um, in the context of the ambitious targets in Foodwise 2025. Um, and I know that the plan in, in that, which is only over the next six years, is to go exports to 19 billion. And I suppose my question really is, do you see... Uh, do you see uh, us achieving those targets based on the um, very many weaknesses and threats that are facing the sector? Um, that's the first question. I suppose the, um, the real concern for the, um, the livestock farmers uh, at the moment is for a lot of them is how are they going to be able to sustain staying in that sector uh, in terms of the kind of prices that they're getting. I mean, farm incomes have uh, dropped by 16% according to the Chagas report last year. Um, and so it is something that is of grave concern to um, farmers in the sector. And, you know, we have to take on board what they're saying. And, you know, I suppose the question I would have to ask is, you know, what is, how is the department engaging to try and help uh, in that, to identify the causes and, and to rectify it? Um, I suppose the other question I have is in relation to the Climate Action Plan which the Government is producing and I'm wondering what engagement you have with Minister Bruton's department because again uh, you know th this is going to be an incredibly challenging area and while uh, it is tremendous to see us as being leaders in this area in terms of how efficient we are. Uh, there's a grave concern in terms of the EU trade policy on uh, taking in beef from the Mercosur countries um, and how you know, if you look at, say, for example, Brazilian uh, beef is produced uh, by cutting down rainforests, and I mean, it's four times more carbon uh, intense than ours is. Uh, and how, how are we going to um, meet that challenge, uh, bearing in mind the impact of Brexit and all of that? Um, the other question I have is in relation to the live exports, because I think there's a perception out there that we're certainly not reaching the uh, potential that they, we could um, and we had some interesting discussion here in relation to layerage capacity. You know, how are you uh, looking at this to see uh, how it, that can be addressed? Um, the other question I had was then in relation to, I see in your, um, you're talking about weaknesses here, um, and that there are difficult, there are skill gaps at all levels of the supply chain. You know, how, are, how is that going to be addressed? Because um, clearly that's going to be something that, uh, well, I mean, if you don't have the skills, you can't continue with the, with the, the, the output. Um, the UK market, and indeed, uh, I mean, if you think about the fact that we're exporting 50% of our beef to the UK, you know, Brexit has a devastating uh, consequences. And uh, how, how you're, I mean, to me, that's the biggest threat actually facing the sector at this stage. And, you know, what, what is the department doing to try and, um, try and manage that? Um, the other question I have is around um, the global growth in protein demand. And if you've examined in detail, you know, what type of protein is being sought uh, in terms of other potential that might be here for um, producing um, plant protein as another option for farmers. And uh, now as a butcher's daughter, I'm not necessarily recommending that, but uh, uh, it is something that I think, I mean, if there's potential there for a market that we should be tapping into, then why shouldn't we do it? Um, what else then? Um, 
Yes, the, um, I mean, the carbon efficient practices, you're saying that the failure for us to adopt carbon efficient practices, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's any resistance on the part of uh, the farmers to do that. I mean, I think uh, there's, um, there's no great difficulty there. I mean, what we're hearing from them is that uh, they're very willing uh, and very able to, um, to do that. Um, and I'm just wondering, how are you monitoring that in terms of the potential they have to be even more efficient or uh, have they reached uh, their peak effectively in terms of efficiency? Next Deputy, uh, Senator Paul Daly, please. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to welcome the officials and apologise at the outset we had to go away for a vote. So if, if I'm repeating anything that was discussed while I was away, I apologise and I will catch up on the debate that I missed on, on the, the transcript. Just basically, I, sp I suppose Deputy Cahill, like, he, he, he hit the nail on top of the head, and it's very hard to, to, to add any or take anything from, from what he said. But like, I, I think the report we got here today is, in, 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 in essence, paying lip service just to, to the beef sector. It's, it's, a pro, it's, it's basically a progress report on Foodwise 2025, which, as you say in it, is a financial target of exports, and there is no volume growth targets. So it's a kind of a swings and roundabout sort of an approach. 19 billion is the target, and if we reach that, we don't care if we can, if we get 19 billion for eggs that year. So be it. We've achieved our target, and and there's no consideration for the, the various sectors within within the agriculture fold. And I think in that regard, beef has and is being thrown under the bus. The beef farmer, in particular, those in 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 regions and in areas where their land and the, the, their their farms are only good for beef rearing or suckler herds. The, the option for them to diversify into the dairy sector is, is a non-runner. So we have to be cognizant of that and we have to take into consideration the livelihoods of those people who have dedicated their, their entire farming lives and probably the, the generation or maybe even two generations before them who are set up in beef, who don't have the option to diversify and are constrained by the, by the land that they're farming to diversify. But, but yet, the report here today is as good as saying we're on target, Brexit aside, and I don't think we even need to mention Brexit here today, because none of us know what's going to happen. And even if David Cameron hadn't called the, the referendum, we'd be still here having this discussion today about the beef sector. It is on its knees. There are people walking away from it. Brexit is going to be the, the final straw or the last nail in the coffin if, if it goes wrong. But as I say, Brexit aside, we'd still be here today and there'd still be a crisis in the beef sector. So I'd just like to know, from the outset, when the target of 19 billion was set, what percentage of that, at the time it was, it was first written down, was to be from the dairy sector, and what percentage was to be from the beef sector? And on the graph at the moment, how have those two lines crossed and interchanged, and what is the current percentage of beef towards that overall figure, and what, in your opinion by 2025, will the percentage of that be from beef and what percentage will be from dairy? Like, as I said, when I said we won't mention Brexit, if there's a hard Brexit, we're throwing food-wise 2025, we're throwing the 19 billion figure out the window. That's a whole new ball game. But if Brexit wasn't there, we can achieve the 19 billion, but we're still going to lose our beef sector. And like it says in your report where the minister is actively pursuing getting ge a geographical indicator for, for Irish beef, well, that'll be all good and fine if we, if, if, we, if we have recognition around the world, but we don't have the beef. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, Senator Mulhern, please. Thank you. Again, um, apologies if I'm going to repeat anything that's been said. Uh, on a, I was away on account of a vote there. Um, just as you know, last week we had uh, uh, Ray Doyle from ICOS here and we had uh, one of the exporters here and they were clearly pointing to a problem in increasing our live exports and the problem is a capacity problem over in Cherbourg and um, I think from a conversation that we had here uh, during questions it became very obvious that you know, with the amount of um, with the amount of calves being born and with the amount of animals that we need to keep moving along, um, that we need to overcome issues around capacity and that it's in 
government's interest that that happens too because we're asking farmers to produce these animals and we have additional calves coming in from the dairy sector. So is, are, are you taking part in finding a solution to the uh, layerage shortage over in Cherbourg? And we were clearly told there isn't a problem with the market, there's not a problem with many other aspects of getting animals abroad. The problem is the layerage in Cherbourg was a very clear message to us and I think we have to respond considering uh, we have to give farmers more options than just the factory uh, that they are and the price they're achieving there at the moment. Um, I, I suppose I, I won't be saying anything new other than to agree um, that um, it's uh, beef farmers, suckler farmers are at a very low ebb and uh, I suppose they're getting angry because they see that they're, they're pumping blood, sweat and tears and money into raising animals and they're losing money. And we all know that that's not a sustainable situation. Um, so that's the way the price is at the moment. Mention has been made of Brexit. But then another issue which I feel hasn't really gotten played out in, in broad stream media is uh, the impact down the line of um, of climate change and what is going to be expected of farmers. Now, we understand the, the carbon efficiency of our farming and the efforts that are being made to improve it, but, you know, there, there's been a lot of, I suppose, criticism to me, a lot of it unfairly of farming, and, and your report, even, I think, um, the chairman mentioned that your report and your SWAT was done in advance of the, the Brexit vote. But equally, the climate change now is becoming centre stage. There's a report being prepared. So where do you, have you any fears about the, the Foodwise 2025 plan um, in relation to, aside from the, 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 in relation to the impact on farmers or what will be demanded of them uh, under any proposed climate change measures. And again, like uh, Deputy Cork and Kennedy asked, like what engagement when you drill down, like what, what can you say to farmers? Uh, because I'm not talking, I know that the issue of an additional carbon tax has been ruled out, which was mentioned by the Citizens' Assembly. But nonetheless, when you have farmers on margins that are, um, they're losing money. I mean, if, if we're going to be imposing more costs on these farmers, I mean, that's only going to keep going in the same direction, which is the wrong way. And if farmers aren't prepared to um, produce animals in, in the same way they have been um, and lose money, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's going to end badly. And I just feel I, I understand the cynicism because um, the cynicism stems from the fact that, I mean, we have reports that's looking at, or we have investigations done in relation to the weak position of the farmer in the food supply chain, but nothing ever seems to happen in reality for the farmer. They're, they continue to be a price taker. They, they don't seem to uh, be having any gains from all the efforts, and I've no doubt efforts have been made into trying to resolve this issue. Um, and just to, to, I suppose, highlight an example of the cynicism, I mean, there's there's a, a message been sent abroad by some of the, the, the new, I suppose, beef plan movement that people shouldn't join the beef environmental efficiency pilot. This is what farmers are being told. Like, there's a lot of cynicism. And even though this is an opportunity, you know, it's not a solution. It's an opportunity. And I, a lot of us worked hard to try and make a case uh, pre-budget to get some more money for farmers in the difficult situation. But it's, um, farmers are at, at a, a, a low ebb and um, they need some pathway out of this that they're, they're going to be assisted or that we'll put this type of farming on a more sustainable footing because, you know, we can have all the targets like Senator Daly said there in relation to exports, but if the, if the person is the primary producer is getting crushed in the process, it won't last too long. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Deputy Murphy? I'll take all the questioners first and then we'll come back to you. Mr. Chair, and of course, I'm, I'm not a member of the committee, but I come in now and again to ask questions and appreciate you and, and the members give me a time. And I'm not going to rehash everything that has been said, but I suppose it's, it's, it's nice to see the, the report here and it gives us an opportunity to discuss the issues and, and, you know, give us our opinions. I suppose what I would say, first of all, is uh, you're well aware of the fact, but uh, the sector, the beef sector, is in such a crisis. And uh, that 
coming from a rural area, that concerns me a lot because in counties like Roscommon and Galway, and, you know, agriculture is still the backbone of our communities. And uh, so many families and so many communities, you know, uh, rely on the, um, on the farming community. And I'm sure uh, you've often heard it said that when farming is going well, the towns and villages are going well because they do tend to spend the money that they make. Um, just following up on previous speakers, I mean, there is what I would call within the farming sector a level of, um, you know, um, of disbelief in, in the future of their industry. And I think that calls for, you know, radical action and a radical plan. And in most cases, you can see that they, you know, um, cattle prices are down at least 100 euro this time last year. And considering all the costs that farmers have to deal with, um, it's, it's, it's just not sustainable. And the, the, the beginning of this movement, that the beef plan group, which is, you know, making significant progress in attracting uh, thousands of members to it, I think clearly shows, it, show, it shows two things. It shows, number one, that the sector is in a massive crisis. But it also shows that people who have been involved in farming um, over a long period of time, they don't want to let go. They want to continue at it. They want to continue to, to make a success of it. But certainly what I'm hearing is, you know, a level of despondency, which uh, concerns me quite a lot. And I, I, I attend quite a number of meetings. Um, the China market is good. Look, we must welcome any efforts made by the department and made by the minister and his staff and made by Board Bia uh, to get new markets. But I think, and you might make a comment to this when you're responding, um, my understanding of the, uh, the, the beef market in China, that it won't be significant on the basis the Chinese people don't like frozen beef. They like fresh beef. And while certainly there will be a certain market for some of that frozen beef, it's not going to be huge. But nevertheless, it's welcome. Uh, the biggest thing, I suppose, for farmers too is, you know, the, the control of the beef industry. And, you know, this, the, I suppose it's like, it's, like that it's like that there's a superpower there controlling uh, farmers and controlling the prices. And again, in recent times, we've seen the takeover of the CD plant in, 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 in Edgerstown in Longford. And again, a byproduct uh, from farming is used there uh, in the CD plant. And the firm who's taken that over are a major player in that business right throughout uh, the British Islands and Europe. And it again, it seems like we're just down to almost one person controlling the business. And that is very frustrating for farmers. And there's one thing that struck me in recent years is I often count maybe a lack of respect for the farmer's point of view sometimes from the factories. They, they, they tend to openly dismiss farmers when they have an issue about price or the future of the business, and they don't engage. Now, anywhere you have a problem or a crisis in any sector of your economy, you have to engage. But sometimes it looks as like that the, that the farmers are slapped down by, by, by the business, by big business, say, look, you'll take what we'll give you, and that's it. And there never seems to be any, and to be honest, there are poor relations between the factories and the farmers in this country. And I blame the factories for that because at times, I would have to say that their, their approach is arrogant towards the farming community, and very arrogant. So that's something that needs to be worked on. And that the level of engagement doesn't happen, in my view, with the, with, with the factories. Um, if you just look at the bull prices at the moment, and you compare the bull prices in Ireland to the prices German farmers are getting, Italian farmers are getting, Spanish farmers are getting, French farmers are getting, way above what Irish farmers are getting. And those sort of prices that Irish farmers are getting is not sustainable. And that is why we need increased funding, in my view, from, for the suckler cow, because if, the, and I don't have to repeat this to you, if the suckler cow people go, our business, our beef business will collapse. And finally, the whole challenge, and, 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 and Senator Mulhern has mentioned, the whole challenge of climate change and, the, and, and what's happening there 
is another massive challenge for the farming community, which has to be, you know, we, ha we have to take it on board, we have to deal with it. But again, it is something that will have to be uh, worked on and worked on, on, very, on, on very quickly. And again, it's, it's, it is of concern to, to farmers. So basically, the point I'm making here is that this sector, unless it gets huge intervention from the department, is going to be in crisis. And if it continues in crisis, uh, more people are going to leave this industry. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Deputy Murphy. And finally, Deputy Healy Ray, I think you have a question, have you? Yes. Um, well, um, I have just a few questions, uh, Chairman. Okay. Um, as as I, 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 I wasn't able to come down here, but I got uh, clips of what he was saying, and uh, basically, the bee farmers or the sucker farmers or uh, all those fellas are, are in a critical state at the present time and they're very, very concerned. And like Deputy Murphy said there, um, the, the meetings uh, that are being held at the present time by this bee plan outfit and the numbers that they are attracting proves that, the fa that, the, that those type of farmers are really concerned. Massive crowds in Castle Island, Kinmere, anywhere, uh, all over Kerry, massive crowds attending these meetings. And young and old are, are at these meetings. And they're very, very concerned. They're at a, they feel they're at a crossroads now because um, there's different things like the climate change and all that. Uh, a lot of it is rubbish, to be honest, Chairman. I mean, when you hear all the Taoiseach of our country suggesting... Well, we'll get into the climate change yeah, conversation now. But it's all... It's, and I'm not getting into it, but when you hear the Taoiseach of our country saying that he, he was doing his bit for the, for the climate by reducing his intake of meat, I mean, that's a real worry to the farmers that I represent and that these men represent around the, the country as well. And, um, uh, you see, if we go back to 2012, uh, Minister Coveney was the Minister for Agriculture at the time, and he, he told farmers that, that, that coming up to the end of the quarter regime that farmers should increase and, and, and expand, and that was grand, the dairy, the, the, the dairy farmers could expand, but, and, and there was uh, efforts made to secure uh, markets for, for dairy and for milk. But I don't believe the same efforts are the same uh, force was put behind it in increasing uh, our, our, our uh, export of live cattle because it's well known if we have more dairy cows, you're going to have more calves, and, 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 uh, and there's going to be, uh, there has to be an outlet for them. And, to, I, and this is one of the big concerns, or one of the big uh, things that's being said at these uh, uh, farmers' meetings is the fact that. Um, the, that they're held to a certain price by the factories. And the factories have all the data. And they know when the animals are reaching 16 months, 24 months, and 30 months. And they have that advantage on the farmers because they know when the, when the volumes of stock are going to appear. And they, and, and they seem to be able to reduce the price at will. And you see, the poor farmer is up, up against that technology you now at the present time. And, I, I, whatever few minutes we get there in the, in, in the order of business, I raised it last week. There's no difference at all in the, in the carcass. That you, you can't see any difference in the carcass that's hanging down there. You can't say it is 29 months, 30 months, 31 months. You can't say that, is, uh, the, the, uh, that it has been moved once, twice, five times, seven times. And, there's something wrong there, and there needs to be an investigation into what's happening, our, 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 the, 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 the factories, and, and the department need to be brought to task about those rules and regulations that are manifesting themselves and hurting the farmers in, in, in the prices that, that are getting. And I'm calling for an inquiry here today, uh, Chairman. How is it that there was a program uh, being done about uh, the Brexit the other day from the maps in the north of Ireland. And the farmers all there, were up there, were delighted with the prices that they were getting at the maps there. And the same story is in, England, in mainland England. How is it just a few miles away from us, I, even though over the ditch we'll say in the north of Ireland, 
What's gone wrong that, that there's such a difference in the price of cattle between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland? Someone, the Minister for Agriculture or whoever is, is responsible, the department or whoever, needs to answer us what's, what's, what's gone wrong that there's such a difference or such a gap in the, in, in the price between north and south. And we deal with the questions that I'm being asked of as a politician at these meetings. That's one of the, the, and it's a serious question, I can't answer it, but uh, I need to get an answer from the minister or from the government or, or the department or whoever is involved because it's totally wrong. The farmers here in, 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 in the south of Ireland, they go through every hoop, they jump through every, uh, the, 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 their animals are, uh, how to say, they're, they're treated immaculately they, and, and they're run there. Farmers, we all that no one can say farmers are, are, are polluters or that they're causing any concern to the environment because they're not. They're, every one of them that I know, they have built slatted sheds and they comply with all, all the data and all the regulations and jump through every hoop, but yet they're not being paid. Board B, I feel, are, are, are on the one hand carrying out inspections and they're, they're seeing after that side of it. But I don't believe that they're marketing our uh, animals uh, and our, our products as good as they could be. Uh, and I'll say that again, they're not doing it as good as they could be. And um, the live trade, uh, I see here in some line here, it's going to be a focus and then again this year. It's going to be a focus. It should be a focus. And there's no question about it because if the live trade didn't open up and if there isn't something uh, don't to, to deal with the extra animals that we're producing. The factories will have another field day this year at the expense of the farmers. So, Chairman, I, 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 I don't think I've been on too long, but the questions that I have are very relevant and mean a lot to the, uh, if we could get answers to why there's such a difference between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland in the price of cattle. Someone has to, has to answer that question for the people that I'm representing. Uh, thanks, thank much, thanks, Deputy. Uh, and just before I come back to you to conclude, um, the roundtable discussions and the brief forum that, that was taking place, there was a number of meetings, as you, as you referenced in your opening contribution. Where is that now at the moment? You know, obviously, the farm organisations, some of them, uh, they all actually, I think, walked away from that in the last period of time. Yeah, at the beginning, it was seen as the great white hope of maybe discussions, in my opinion, everybody say all the stakeholders sitting down around the table is very important to try and get a kind of a fair solution. But it became, it seemed to become a bit of a talking shop, more so than an action, uh, an action shop, if I could put it as such, before it actually came to a conclusion. Where is that now at the moment? Uh, and are there plans within the, from the department to reinvigor or reinstitute uh, a similar type forum going forward? Uh, and the other question I have for you, just to, before I finish up, uh, you mentioned that you're presently reviewing uh, or doing another SWOT analysis of, of looking forward as regards 2030. You know, a, the perception, rightly or wrongly, was that it was from top down with the previous one, with Food Harvest or Food Waste 2025. What kind of a consultation process or discussion process do you intend having with, with regard where we go from here? Uh, in advance of 2030, will you be going down to talk to, I suppose, not just the farm organisations, but those actually producers on the ground, uh, the feet on the ground as such, to try and get, a, I suppose, an in-depth knowledge of exactly what's happening and what requirements are required going forward to see exactly can, can we get most benefits uh, for the prime producer uh, by now in 2030. Okay, Thanks, Chairperson. Um, so, just in relation to the beef round table, the, the last meeting was uh, of that round table was in October. Um, Minister Creed used the opportunity to urge uh, stakeholders to recognise their interdependency and to support the sector through examination of mechanisms to add value along the supply chain and increase the strength of all links in the supply chain. Now, we normally have two of those, those meetings a year. There, there are no plans as yet for this year, but we'd hope that that, because as you say, having people around the table is, is a positive. Uh, in relation to the, the Michael Dowling group, I mentioned uh, the, the Foodwise Meat Implementation Group. That included a range of stakeholders from processors and from farm organisations, and I think was, was a very positive group and, and came up with some, some very useful input 
uh, that have now been added in the form of actions to, to, uh, to implement FoodWise. Um, just to touch on, on some of the, the questions that, that came across from a range of the, the, the members of the committee. Um, I suppose there, is, there can be a, a slight uh, misconception about the FoodWise um, projections of particularly the 19 billion in exports. Really, the intention of FoodWise is that it's an enabling strategy to, to enable the, the, the entire agri food sector to develop to the best of its potential, and including very detailed actions as to how, um, as to what actions the, st the department and its agencies and other, other departments should take from a policy point of view to, to create the best environment for the sector to grow and prosper. And then, if all of those uh, recommendations were implemented, the committee that drew up FoodWise projected that the, the opportunity was there to increase exports uh, by up to 19 billion uh, in 2025. So it's not a specific target. It's you know it's not a specific target in that it's not broken down into sectoral targets. It's a, a, a vision of the opportunity that's there. Uh, in terms of where we are on that, on that, on working towards that uh, 2025 vision, uh, we had exports of 13.6 billion euros in total last year. The opportunity is certainly there when we, we get the feedback from Borbia in terms of market development. Uh, if we didn't have the elephant in the room of Brexit, uh, I think I could be saying quite confidently that that 19 billion is certainly achievable. Certainly when Borbia look to, uh, to growth markets in Asia, the, there are significant demands for additional, um, additional protein, but also there's, there's growing middle classes in those markets uh, and upper classes indeed, who want premium quality uh, Western type products and we are well placed to, to meet, to fill that demand. Just, is, is the, the protein, increase in protein demand for beef and dairy, is that, is, that, is that the preferred choice for maybe a more affluent market rather than uh, plant protein foods, pro well, protein plant foods? I mean, uh, traditionally as, as economies have emerged, they've, they've moved up the, they've increased their consumption of protein products, uh, of animal-based protein in general, uh, substituting for, for a more plant-based diet when, when they have a lower um, level of, of economy. So if we take China, as I, as I mentioned previously, uh, average Chinese beef consumption is five or six kilos per person per year. That compares to 19 kilos in Ireland. So even a small increase, you know, of one billion people eating a, a little bit more beef on an annual basis, there's a huge oppor growth opportunity there. So that's there. the trend we're responding to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the vision for the circular sector, I suppose the, the lack of profitability in circular farming is not a new issue. I mean, we go back 20 years and uh, over 100% of circular farm income was from uh, payments at that stage, which were really headage payments and coupled payments based on, uh, based on retaining the animals. Um, and since decoupling in 2003, that people have generally persisted in their existing farming system. So suckler cow numbers have certainly decreased, but probably more gradually than we would have expected, uh, based on if you were just operating on the economics of, of the issue. Um, in terms of the vision for the future of the sector, what, what the department would like to do is to s support the sustainable, efficient and um, profitable development of the sector through policies to increase competitiveness and to act as a regulator to, to ensure that that food is produced to the highest standards because food safety obviously has to be at the, at the basis of everything that we do. Um, in terms of beef from dairy, there was a couple of specific questions. Um, the department in conjunction with Chagas ICBF and others in the meat and dairy processing industries are currently examining greater integration in the supply of beef from the dairy herd to complement the existing supply of high quality beef from the suckler herd. 
This involves looking at areas in which the dairy industry can work together with the beef industry to improve the quality of beef coming from the dairy herd through improved breeding, calf rearing and management practices and the genotyping of beef progeny from the dairy herd. There are also initiatives, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in relation to discussing with DG Agri the possibility of achieving a GI status for Irish beef. Again, that's not, that's not by any means the answer to profitability, but it, it would, would be a significant selling point in some markets if we had that GI status, particularly when we come to future EU trade negotiations. Uh, Board B and Chagas have also looked towards developing a standard for grass-fed Irish beef and dairy, which again in certain markets would be a significant selling point. Um, if I come then towards um, a, a lot of uh, the, the deputies and senators commented on Irish prices versus EU prices, and of course that we acknowledge that that is a difficulty. I suppose my, my opening statement did focus very much on, on food-wise and the beef sector, as, as that is, I suppose, the main topic of our discussion today. But we acknowledge that uh, Irish prices have, have been uh, at a low level, particularly in the last quarter of last year and coming into this year, and didn't have that uptick that normally happens towards the end of, um, towards the, the end of the winter season. And that has been a difficulty for, for farmers. So we certainly acknowledge that and are making every effort uh, to provide uh, support to the sector, particularly, I suppose, through, through the, the BEEP uh, scheme, which was announced in the budget and launched recently. I'd stress that the closing date for applications is Friday. It is, although modest, it is a really good scheme. Uh, it pro it will provide farmers with, as well as a cash injection, it will provide them with really detailed information on the weaning efficiency of their own suckler cows and enable them to make better decisions. So I would say if, if people are hesitating, uh, they should certainly put in an application. I'm going to ask Maria to, to, to come in just in terms of the application process. And it's yeah, we very much, um, the, the beef environmental efficiency pilot, it was very much devised in consultation with the key stakeholders. I know there was a comment here that people are being told not to take it up. I would urge people to take it up. It has been devised to be as simple as possible. It's de been devised to ensure that as much of the money, the payment got to the farmer as possible. And it targets both the environmental and the economic efficiency. And we really believe in terms of supporting the suckler herd, that's the way we have to progress. It has to be about environmental as well as economic efficiency. It's a one-year pilot. Um, it's up to 40 euro um, per, per calf. Very simple, all you have to do is weigh the calf and dam, record the weights and submit it to ICBF. So the um, application form is absolutely simple. It's really just an indication that you're going to submit the weights, but it needs to be in with the department by Friday. Um, it could be done online or a, a paper application can be got from the division in Port Leash. But we would definitely urge people to, um, to support it. The feedback we have got from the farming bodies has been very positive about it. It mightn't be as much money as they would have liked, but it's been acknowledged that it was devised in consultation with them and that it's a step in the right direction. So just a couple of other specifics from my chair. Um, Deputy McConnell referenced a, a recent uh, a UN um, and FAO database, uh, which um, in relation to climate change, and just to say that the department is engaging strongly with FAO on that database results, and FAO have, have assured us that those um, those results, it's really a, a database in development, if you like, and those results are not com comparable between member states. So we've certainly were engaging to make sure that the the, the right inputs are put into that uh, into that exercise. Um, in relation to carbon efficiency and the, the climate debate, obviously colleagues are very closely involved in that debate and in, in, uh, in input to uh, climate action with the Department of um, Communications, Climate and uh, Environment. And um, I suppose a lot of our, our efforts under the existing World Development Programme and in the BEEP have been focused on, on increasing carbon efficiency further which has both environmental and economic benefits for farmers. 
because in most cases, taking actions that, that increase your carbon efficiency also have the benefit of, of improving your, your economic efficiency to some extent. Um, uh, several members mentioned live exports, and I know that you've had a detailed session with, with some of my colleagues in relation to the department's um, responsibilities on live exports, and uh, I'm sure uh, colleagues would be happy to, to come back and update on, on those issues as there are developments. Um, in relation to uh, skills specifically, um, I think Senator uh, Corcoran Kennedy mentioned uh, skills needed in the sector, and certainly we would see knowledge transfer groups as essential in, in both in providing inf information, in peer learning, in um, addressing these new challenges, and, and at a, in a practical way at farm level, that farmers working together and discussing common issues are really the best way of, of transferring those skills. Um, Sorry, Sorry, Sorry. 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 Uh, the issue of layerage and, and what the department is doing to try and move along the issue of providing additional capacity in Sherbrooke. I think I will ask my, my colleagues to come back to you in more detail. Uh, there was a session recently with the, right. with the committee in, in relation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'll ask, give us an well, update, uh, an update yeah, maybe on where things are. Things have escalated. Has, yeah. has, has, they have escalated, is right, and we're in the middle, yeah. as has been said, at the calving season. And last week we were told there, there wasn't at least then uh, an immediate solution on the horizon. And obviously we're at a critical point, so mm -hmm. an update would be helpful, Chair. Okay. Well, obviously, leverage capacity is not an issue. It is an issue for the, the exporters rather than for the department. The department's focus is on ensuring the highest standards of animal welfare because unless those standards are maintained, there will be no live export trade. Indeed, but if we can't export and there's a big glut of animals and farmers are, are hard pressed financially, you can have an animal welfare issue on our own soil here. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll ask for, for an you. update. Yeah. Briefly, Senator Murphy has a re related question. Yeah, well, thanks, Sinead, very much for uh, quite a lot of detail and all the answers there. Just to focus back, and maybe you have uh, dealt with this before I come in, the Chinese market and the potential you see on the basis that it's a frozen beef, uh, you know, to see, see that it would be limited. And again, I repeat, it's a great idea to be getting new markets, but it would seem to be rather limited. And I would echo what you said in relation to the beef scheme. Uh, that is an important scheme, and I know people are saying it's little money, but we should all encourage people to get involved in it, um, because there is a bit of negativity towards it, but hopefully uh, farmers will take up that and note the deadline on the 22nd. But the, the China market and the possible potential you see out of it. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Maria, might want yeah. comment on that? Um, okay, just to say, um, we have had a lot of efforts on diversifying trade and opening new markets coming out of the Minister's seven-point action plan last April. We had three successes last year, three big successes in beef last year. China was only one of them, but I suppose a very important one. Um, we opened the market for frozen boneless beef. Um, and I take the point that was made earlier that a lot of what goes into third country markets is awful, but we specifically, the Chinese access is for frozen boneless beef. We have uh, 11 meat plants now approved to export to China, six of them beef and five of them pig meat plants. When we have gone back and sat down with the companies that are active out there and the ask from them is for actually more plants to be approved. Good. They say the issue they have is they have a concern about not being able to meet the volume um, that the Chinese contracts um, require. So their first ask is not to expand beyond that boneless beef. I mean, there is a list mm -hmm. of things, but the priority it's is for nice. more plants to be approved. So we have, and off the top of my head, I think 11 more files out there, but I could be wrong, could be 10 or 12 more files out there. Um, and they definitely would see the potential for a lot more to be shipped out there, and that is solely in frozen boneless beef. After that, we will then look at expanding out into um, other subsectors. Yeah, good news. And we've certainly seen significant enthusiasm from the Chinese consumer for, the, I mean, I suppose the way they, they use that beef is quite different from the way we use it domestically. So. Uh, they'll take uh, frozen cuts and slice them very thinly and put it into their traditional cuisine. And there's huge enthusiasm there for, for, 
24 hours brief. And I suppose the point is you open the market and it takes time to establish course, it. But course, the companies yeah. are very focused on China and it is seen as um, it is a massive win among our other EU colleagues that we um, achieved that. Um, last year in 2018 we also got um, access to Qatar and to Kuwait and they are also for, um, it's also for bonus beef. Okay, then, yeah, Chair, there's a couple of points. The, the, uh, the beef producer group, the capacity of that to influence, uh, any sort of have a positive influence in the market, given that it's it'll be regarded as being oversupplied currently. Um, and also, the unfair trading practices, the proposals from Europe. How exactly can that impact uh, positively on our beef, um, on our beef sector? Those two points. Thank you, Producer groups, we would see as, I mean, none of these strands are, are the entire answer to, to uh, increasing beef prices or, you know, there's no magic solution, but they're all worthwhile in themselves. Beef producer groups, we would see as perhaps having, uh, certainly giving the farmers more of a, a, a negotiating uh, platform with, with factories, particularly if they can differentiate themselves into local products or into uh, GI status, that those are avenues that we can see towards, towards uh, increasing profitability for a particular producer group. Um, in relation to UTPs, yes, I mean, the, the, the directive is, the practices prescribed or limited in the directive are very much focused at retail level. Uh, but I suppose it's a direction of travel, if you like, that um, it's a part of a series of initiatives across the EU aimed at uh, the EU system aimed at uh, improving transparency in the supply chain. I suppose we've seen at, uh, at retailer level um, significant acknowledgement of the role of the farmer, of the importance of the farmer in supplying uh, beef and other products to, to retailers. And um, you would hope that there's, there's a pressure there for uh, some of that, the profit along the chain to be passed back to the primary producer. But obviously no one strand of those initiatives is going to be a solution in itself. Just point I made in relation to the EU average price, the, this, the flip in the last year from uh, Irish beef gaining more than the EU average price to gaining less than the EU average price and the department's assessment of that dynamic? Yes, Deputy. I mean, it is, it's clearly disappointing that, that Ireland is currently below the EU average price. Um, some of that is related to other markets, Germany and France, for instance. This, this time of year tends to be their highest price time of year and we're, we're at the opposite end of that, that spectrum. Obviously, the UK is still part of that EU average price at the moment and is, is, is weighting it upwards. Um, but I would acknowledge that it is, it is disappointing that, that the Irish price has been, I suppose, consistently at its current level for some time without, without any uptick. Before you conclude, Ms. Phillips, um, in the conversation we're having, and we'll have over the next number of weeks, it's going to be a difficult conversation. There doesn't seem to be any particular silver bullet, if I could put it as such, to sort out or to try and bring a bit of stability to the markets. Um, is it sustainable that we will continue, in your opinion, that we will continue to kill in excess of 35,000 cattle per week in the country? Uh, is it sustainable that our numbers, uh, are our numbers too high, in your opinion? As we look towards 2030, where would you see our suckler numbers uh, in 2030 as opposed to where we are now at the moment? That's that's a very <laughs> that's a very difficult question. Sure, um, certainly. Uh, I suppose in 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 the past uh, there were there were different thresholds seen as as um, you know. I think several years ago uh, people would have said if if the slaughter figures went over thirty thousand a week, then the, the, there would be a price decrease. Well, that, that is uh, happening. I suppose once we go, I suppose thirty two, thirty three thousand, we don't seem to be in trouble on a regular basis, don't we? That's a fact, isn't it? Well, the, the, there's certainly there are certainly it's one of the factors and probably a strong factor. I mean, we're at thirty eight thousand now. We've been you know in that region for the last for the last few months, so it's definitely a factor. But I mean, there's a range of factors in yeah, well, I appreciate price, that, and yeah. it, it is it is very much a, a commodity market. 
uh, looking towards the future, I suppose, again, we come back to, you know, our twin main challenges of, of both climate change and climate change, Brexit impact uh, and the, the, uh, the baseline profitability of suckler farming and whether people will, will persist in that occupation. Now, if we went back uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, both Willa and I were, were analysing the um, uh, circular farming at that stage, and we were saying, you know, when, when beef is decoupled, when beef supports are decoupled from production, there will be a massive decline in circular numbers. You know, this was in 2003. That never happened because there's obviously more at play than just economics. I mean, people persist in, the, in their farming system uh, because of the, you know, they are, they are wedded to that farming system. It's probably how, how, how did the numbers, sorry, I have a good question. How did the numbers <clears throat> compare to 2003 versus 2019? They, they've certainly declined. I mean, I think if we went back from, if we have numbers between 2010 and 2017, uh, circular cows have declined by around 7%. So that is, you know, there's a gradual decrease there, certainly, but not anything as dramatic as we would we would have expected, based on purely on the economics. So there's certainly as behaviour. A, as say. an observation, mm. um, in terms of the demographic and the profile of farmers now, like we really are at a point in the country which wasn't the case maybe uh, as 20 years ago, where most our young people get to go to third level and they actually have a lot more options than they ever had 15, 20 years ago when you described. And I believe, I don't know what your uh, view, I believe that that's going to have a big bearing on, you know, young people, they want, they've gone to college, they want a job that's playing a reasonable income, and most of those jobs are actually in the big urban centres or cities. And that that's going to have a big factor, because at the moment you have farmers part-time farming where I am in the West, and then they'll be supplementing their income uh, with, you know, they're, they're still, doing the best they can on the land they can, but they're, they're having to work part-time, but I don't know how much it, it will continue. I, I, we could be at a pivotal point here, mm. notwithstanding what you've said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose many, many, it's a reality that, that many circular farms are part-time. Some of them are, are uh, farmed by farmers who don't have off-farm employment, often because of their age, that the, you know, they're at a stage in their lives where, where they're not going to farm off-farm. I suppose looking towards the future for young people, what we would see is that we want uh, the farming enterprise to be as efficient and, and profitable as possible, even though it may be a part-time enterprise. That we wouldn't, we certainly don't want uh, to um, have anything in terms of department supports or schemes that that uh, is negative towards part-time farming as a legitimate occupation, um, because certainly young people even on a part-time basis, can bring a lot of innovation and adaptation of new technology and make it a more, um, a more efficient enterprise. Okay, any more questions, members? Okay, thanks very much, uh, Ms. McPhillips and your team, for coming here today. This is the beginning of a conversation we're having, as you know, over the next number of weeks, and I'm sure you'll be in touch with us as regards maybe some of the information that maybe you might have, an update on, on the export issue maybe uh, in due course. There's enough for the business meeting to journal until next Tuesday, the 26th at 3.30 p.m. Thank you.